All right, it looks like we're ready to get started, everyone. Um, so I wanna welcome you all to Social Justice Week 2023. Um, SSU student Shelby Wade created Sonoma State's Social Justice Week and it launched in 2015. The goal is to provide a space for not only the Sonoma State student body, but the community as well to contribute ideas, gain perspective, and get an understanding of current social issues. Its mission is to one, connect students with advocates who help students develop a theoretical understanding of whose land SSU sits upon and the power of grassroots activism for human betterment and social change, while raising student and community awareness and engagement with issues embedded in societal social structures of inequality, colonialism, imperialism, classism, ableism, sexism, patriarchy, heterosexism, queerphobia, transphobia, xenophobia, and other religious and other discrimination. Second, its mission is to involve students in social justice issues and organizations which produce socially responsible students who are educated to be effective personal and social change agents in the pursuit of justice. Third, our mission is to engage the community in collaborative partnerships and the that strengthen communities, provide services, and prepare students. And finally, our final mission is that it contributes to equitable distribution of economic, political, civil, cultural, social, and other resources and opportunities in society in order to, pro to promote personal campus and community development. I would also like to take a moment for us all to honor the land that Sonoma State University and Sonoma County lie on. Long before California, Sonoma County, and Sonoma State University, the land around us was inhabited by indigenous people collectively known as the Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo. Now they are formally recognized as the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria and chaired by Greg Saris, who also holds the Great and Rancheria Endowed Chair at SSU. Sonoma State acknowledges in gratitude the Rancheria's ancestors for their stewardship of the land and all of its resources and thank the current membership for their partnership and a number of educational initiatives, including the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria Learning Center at the Fairfield Osborne Preserve, located on Sonoma Mountain. My name is Abigail Har, and I'll be your host this evening. I'm a graduating senior in the Criminology and Criminal Justice Studies program. I'm also currently president of the Pre-Law Society and a student assistant at the library here at Sonoma State University. I will now introduce our speaker tonight, Troy Williams. Our speaker's bio is quite extraordinary. On October 29, 2014, Troy Williams was released after serving 18 years of a life sentence in San Quentin State Prison. While incarcerated, Troy was able to accomplish a lot. While serving his time, he was able to venture outside the box of inmates and create a capacity to produce, write, direct, film, edit, and or assist with the organization of almost every video and radio production inside San Quentin in the past seven years. He has also co-organized co restorative justice symposiums, health fairs, job fairs, numerous self-help workshops, and more. Troy has successfully been able to coordinate media, restorative justice, and communication techniques in one of the toughest environments in the world. He has been in the unique position of acting as a liaison between inmates, volunteers, community organizations, prison administrators, and outside media organizations. Under his leadership as executive director of San Quentin's Restorative Justice Roundtable, prisoner participation grew from less than 40 to more than 200. Troy is also the co-founder of several life skills, emotional awareness, and financial literacy programs. He has trained many individuals in restorative justice, circle process, effective communication, media engagement, and writing for print, radio, and video from a restorative justice perspective while navigating the bureaucracy of prison politics. In 2010, Troy founded the San Quentin Prison Report, 
which is a media production company that produces radio and video content inside San Quentin. On November 12th, 2014, Troy accepted an award for excellence in journalism from the Society of Professional Journalists on behalf of the San Quentin Pro Prison Report and is currently writing as a freelance columnist for the Oakland Post, um, is a radio reporter and producer of Life of the Law, and media fellow with the Game Changers Project, as well as working in partnership with many numerous organizations. Alongside all of his other accomplishments, Troy has also recently formed a limited liability company named Troy Williams Productions and a not-for-profit organization named Restorative Media, whose mission is to develop transformative stories for social change. Before I hand over the microphone to Troy, I will now read our ground rules. The first part of this session will be a presentation and you will have a chance to interact with the speaker during the second part of the presentation, the question and answers. As part of our continuing commitment to social justice work, when we experience examples of oppression, we will speak up. This means we can interrupt during the meeting and draw the issue of, to one another's attention. We will do this kindly, with care, and in good faith. This statement is a reminder that we commit to do this in the service of ending oppression. Also, please remember to step up and also step back. This means if you speak often, then maybe don't speak as much. And if you don't speak as much, speak more. Be courteous to others and avoid inflammatory language. Speak from your own perspective and criticize ideas, not individuals. We will not tolerate any derogatory nor hateful language or actions. Avoid speaking over each other and respect each other's uh, contributions. The consequences of violating the ground rules will be warnings, and if they persist, you will be asked to leave the event. Hecklers will not be tolerated and will result in instant removal from the session. Also, please make sure to take a look at the surveys that have been placed on your chairs. We will be collecting them later after the event. I will now hand over the microphone to Troy. I feel like I can go sit down after reading that resume, huh? <laughs> um, yeah, I do want to reinforce the fact that um, if there's anything that uh, I say that brings about a question of curiosity or um, difference of opinion, uh, I love engagement. I feed off of that. And I think that that's important. One of the founding um, principles of my restorative practices means that all of the stakeholders have to be at the table. And sometimes we have to have longer conversations to get to um, some kind of mutual understanding and, and I'm all for that. Y'all with me? All right, thank you. So once again, my name is Troy Williams and I am hopefully going to define what it has meant for me uh, to step into the power of my lived experience and uh, to control my own narrative, right? Um, as you see, I, I, want, I want to start off by asking you all a question. What, what makes an expert? What, what's an expert? No wrong answer. Yes. Lived experience, okay? I'm going to just start pointing to people. <laughs> now nobody wants to look at me. <laughs> What what makes an expert? Yes. Extensive research. Okay, one more. Give me one more. What makes an expert? Yes. Got it. Okay. I appreciate all of those because I think all of those make it make make it up in my mind what makes an expert. I ask this question because um, prior to my being paroled, a group of us had a conversation on the prison yard and we were like, what, what makes it up? What, what's an expert? That conversation came up and somebody said, well, 10,000 hours of experience, um, your ability to do something that, you know, that few others can do. Um, and then somebody else chimed in, they asked me how much time I've been down. And at that point, um, you know, I've, 
spent a total of 25 years of my life incarcerated. And one of the older guys on the yard said, uh, you're an expert. It's up to others to prove you're not. And so I came home and I started to get involved in all of the activism that was going on in my community. And I found myself in uh, groups where people were talking about what they were going to do to end mass incarceration. They were having all of these like scholarly debates and discussions. And we I was in there for at least an hour and a half. And I raised my hand finally and I said, um, I asked who here has been incarcerated and nobody raised their hand. And I, I, I said, I have a problem with y'all. I have a problem that we're trying to solve an equation and, and, and not all the pieces of the equation are even at the table, right? We're trying to solve an equation for somebody else. Um, so I'm, I'm going to back up a little bit and I'm going to forward, I'm going to fast forward to that point. Um, in 2007, Discovery Channel uh, came to the prison yard. Um, Bruce Sanofsky, who filmed Metallica back in the day, uh, he also uh, was a um, award-winning documentarian of a show called Paradise Lost. Uh, it was about the, it was, I think there were two different episodes, the West Memphis, Memphis Street, where some kids were falsely accused of committing a murder that they could not have committed because the, the way it happened that whoever cut the bodies up had to be a surgeon. They could not have been 14 year old kids who were accused of that crime. Um, so Bruce came in and they took us through this eight week um, training program. And um, I want to, I want to show y'all this and then I'm going to go more into detail. The, that first video on Hummer Beginning San Quentin Film School. So we got your storyboards. Yeah. This is like another form of, of you communicating to your DP. He stumbles forward and we see the arrow in his back. At the end. I want you to go from stretch to baseball mound. Keep it simple, but with great content. And that, that'll be the power behind it, I guess. She's smiling. And then, but she responds to it, right? She put that, yeah. And then cuts up to him. Uh -huh. Then he's like, man, I, I gotta go, you know? So the scene that I do want, though, is him opening his door right here and the dog. Dog? Dog over here. Scratching on the door. Where are we going to get a dog from, man? Where are we going to get a dog from? How come yours is not as complicated as me? Well, so I put a lot of work into mine. This ain't, it was complicated. I just didn't type that up. I took, I put a lot of work into that. You, you got your script, right? Yeah. And you kind of kind of got what your vision is, right? Yeah. But like, usually what happens in situations, you get like, some actors, they, they want to add their own flavor. I know you're, you're looking for that. So like, let them do that, right? But let them do it one way how you want it to. Oh, yeah. All right, let's see what they got, man. Okay. Good luck. All right, thank you. Yeah. I'd like to ask for the divine creator, whatever you call his name, by the blessings in our little endeavor here, and that may we operate as in unison with um, a high quality of organization. Mitch and Luke, you guys are carrying some of the heaviest roles, but I picked you guys because I know that you can pull it off. So y'all want to walk through it right now, or y'all? Yeah, let's, let's do this. Okay, let's, uh, let's roll. From, uh... Walk through it the way you guys got it. All right. Look, man, it's written all over you. All right. You gotta learn to control. You gotta learn to control your anger. Man, now how you expect me to do that with all these suckers around here? Yeah. Okay. I'm glad you asked. Okay. You gotta let him reflect for a second. Mm -hmm. And then once he reflects and you see the shift in his in his in his expression change, that's when you be like, look, because now you you letting him know like like I'm not against you. Look, man, I ain't gonna make the same mistakes you made. Yeah, you will if you don't find out what's at the root of your anger. Man, I said I ain't angry. Let <laughs> you tell it. It's written all over you, man. You got to you got to learn to control that. Man, how do you expect me to control my anger when I got all these suckers around me, man? Glad you asked that. That was good. I gotta make some more mental notes. But that was that was. I think that'll work. Thank uh, you. 
Thank you, thank you for writing. Bro. Bro. I'm really good stuff, for real, man. You shine, I shine, we shine. And then we get to shine a big old light. You know what I'm saying? And you think they'll show this at Cannes Film Festival? We want an Oscar. We want an Oscar, baby. Okay, all right. So I want y'all to keep in mind that this is the one of the first times that um, cameras had been on the prison yard with uh, incarcerated people filming, telling stories, right? I want you to imagine at this time, this is 2007. Now at this time, um, whenever media came in, this was in the days of lockup. This was in the days of fear mongering. We would sit up and we would watch cameras come to the prison yard and news organizations come in and our most intellectual, our best guys would go out and have that conversation with them and they still made them look like buffoons. And we realized that it wasn't just about telling your story, but it was about controlling your story. It's about producing your own story, right? So, but we still at the beginning. When these cameras go out and we're walking with staff, one of the first times these cameras came out, we're walking with staff um, with the, the free person um, who is in charge of San Quentin Television um, and some guards come up and they pull us all against the wall and they ask us, where did we get the equipment from? <laughs> we like, we snuck it in through visioning. What do you mean where we got the equipment from? <laughs> ask your warden, right? The warden allowed it in here. So we got a lot of pushback from the guards because initially the guards took it as though this was a tool that was going to expose them, right? And then on the other side of that coin, there was a the prison population, right? Um, the only time the prison population was used to seeing cameras on the yard was when the goon squad was coming to collect evidence. So we got pushed up on from guys on the yard, like, what, what's up? What's going on? What y'all doing with them cameras? We want to ask people from the interview. I ain't doing no interview. Get get out my face. There was a lot of pushback. So they had we had to do a lot of educating as to how this tool could be used to benefit us. And one thing that we even started doing with the guards on the inside is that we started to highlight the things that we felt they were doing right. So we, if a guard was, you know, we didn't ask for nothing special, but if the guard is doing, um, did something that was like outstanding or something that um, showed his humanity towards somebody that was incarcerated, we created a piece about that. And guess what? More people wanted to do positive stuff because they saw that we wasn't gonna use it as a tool. And the truth is we couldn't use it as a tool. I'm a, put y'all in on a little secret the warden told me at this time. He says, I'm pushing for this program to work. And if my staff don't like it, they can find another job somewhere else. He said, but I want you to be aware of one thing. He says, be careful what you say, because you may only get to say it once. And you may end up in a position where I couldn't even protect you, right? So we had to be very smart because a part of us, a part of me wanted to come out and then like, you know, <laughs> like part of me wanted breaking news live here from San Quentin State Prison. The guards are sitting down on their butts and they're not really working, right? <laughs> I wanted to expose him, right? The guard knew that guy was gonna get stabbed on the fifth tier, but he turned a blind eye, right? We, we, we wanted to do that, but the moment we did that, we would wind up in Pelican Bay shoes somewhere trying to explain something else. So we knew we had to be real conscious about how we presented information. And besides that, um, there was a gatekeeper, right? Nothing was leaving that prison without prior approval from administration, right? Um, even the same administration that was setting out to help us still was not going to let information out that would expose that system in a way that you could with cameras, right, on the inside of it. Um, so after they left, 
um, we started to like, and I'm using the word unionize, but we really, you know, you definitely couldn't call it a union, but I, I was the self-proclaimed union rep. <laughs> so every time cameras came onto that yard, I showed up, Criminal Minds. I was like, hey, how y'all doing? <laughs> What's going on? I'm Troy Williams. I'm the resident filmmaker. I'm here to make sure that y'all going to do right by us. Um, Fruitvale Station, the Oscar Grant story um, showed up. Uh, if you if you guys look in that scene, a few of us are in there. You'll see me in it, but don't blink. If you blink, you're liable to miss me. Uh, but I, I am in the visiting room scene. You can see me from an angle, like right sitting right there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so all of these and cer certain news agencies showed up, and we were like, we're not, we're not gonna deal with them. We don't. We don't trust them. We don't trust by their previous record or by the way that they're acting. We don't trust how they're gonna deal with us, right? Um, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to that when I start to talk about the prison within. Uh, I'll I'll come back to that part. But after uh, after that, I initially started up what was gonna be San Quentin Film School too. Um, and that quickly turned into us wanting to do our own thing. Um, and I launched the San Quentin Prison Report. The San Quentin Prison Report um, began as us, we would initially go out onto the yard and any major event that was happening, we would document that event. If it was a three hour event, that's what we recorded. And that's what we put on San Quentin closed circuit system. If it was a graduation, um, the basketball games, baseball games, we documented all that and we put it on the station. Um, what I what I quickly realized also was that a lot of our three hour events was like really boring, <laughs> right? Everybody sit there and just watch. Cause you, you know, you had this graduation and you wanted everybody to feel proud to see themselves on the screen, like walking across, you know, with their, you know, flail and, you know, documents and all that stuff. But what we started to do was we started to take these longer segments and reduce them into smaller um, bite-sized um, pieces. And we streamed all that into a 30 minute show called the San Quentin Prison Report. From the prison report, um, this next one you can play kind of like at a low tune if you want. This is just this is our theme song. I, I love our theme song right here. This this soundtrack was created by Caesar. Um, Caesar was one of our incarcerated guys. Um, um, Caesar was one of our incarcerated guys. It's it's just gonna be music, hopefully. No. Um, but Caesar. Caesar was one of our incarcerated guys, and Caesar, um, Caesar was Caesar was brilliant. Um, what we had access to, maybe not, but what we had access to, it's okay. We don't we don't have to. I'll um, we don't have to. It, it's just it was a theme song for, um, for the for the prison report. How you should come on. It's just really a, the soundtrack part. But uh, I wanted to show that because that was also created inside. So here we have inside, we have a wealth of talent that is just like, like sitting there, you know? Guys would come up and they would, they knew I had the studio and they wanted, they wanted to produce music. And my goal was to push them into producing something that was bigger than, you know, a bunch of B words and N words, right? How do we take this music and make it something that would that you would be proud if your son or if your daughter uh, listened to. Uh, also have in this document right here, uh, repentance. Repentance is my first sizzle reel. Um, is is when I look back on it, I I think I I cringe a little bit. I think we all do at our first at our first bodies of work. <laughs> we can play a piece of it if we want to, but I'm not gonna. Um, 
horrify y'all by having y'all sit through the whole thing. But I actually, I actually think it's a good thing. It was really what was at my heart of wanting to to give back, um, wanting to be able to give back, to give back to the community, to give back to, um, which one is that one? Huh? No, okay, we can we can wait on that one. That's not the one. That's it. Yeah. In, for the scissor reel? Yeah. It's okay. Maybe at some point I'll send out, because all of this is on my Vimeo page, I can send out some links if people want to go through and they can see the work. You can see um, all of our other, a few other prison reports that I was able to get. I actually have a lot of footage from inside that I'm right now just getting and putting it all together. But the point that I'm getting to here is how over time, um, what began there has developed into something that is really big. I'm sure y'all heard about a lot of programs and things that are coming out of prison right now concerning videos and podcasts and everything. Well, this is this is where it started at. This this is where it all started. Um, I'm gonna go fast forward to the prison within, um, and if you can play the other one, the 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 first one. By the time I was 13, and I was getting chased by some gang members, instead of me running to the police station. I tried to make it to the other side of the park where I knew that this particular gang's rival gang hung out at. Because I was more afraid of the police than I was of the gangs in my in my neighborhood. I did not recognize the onslaught that was happening against my spirit. Is the other one there too? The first, the other um, prison within one? Did you play that one too? We started off with this one at the Santa Barbara um, International Film Festival. It started doing very well, and then COVID shut us down. Um, but this is one documentary that I'm very um, proud of. So Catherine Hervey, um, when I said this, the part I'll get back to, Catherine Hervey is one of the people who came in, and she came in and she was starting to tell his story. And, you know, of course, the institutional film rep Troy Williams walked up to her and was like, what are you doing? What's going on? Why are you here? What's the film about? And we hit it off, right? We hit it off really nice. He was somebody that appeared very trust trustworthy to me. And I felt he had good intentions that was going to show us in a good light. And uh, I began helping her on the inside. Now, mind you, when I'm helping her, I have a life sentence. I don't know if I'm ever coming home. Like, and, and I had, there was no home for me in sight. I just was doing it because I wanted something positive about us to reach the outside world. Because once again, at this time, and prior to this time, everything that they came in and told the world about us gave reasons for them to keep us incarcerated because nobody knew our story. Everybody heard the story of the prison riots and the, the stabbings, but nobody heard the story of the father who's crying because he don't know where his daughter's at. Nobody heard those stories. Nobody heard the story of the guy who'd been gone so long that he lost his mom and his daddy and everybody that he loved. Nobody heard the story of the guy who gets on the phone and stops a drive-by from a phone call. Nobody heard those stories. Nobody knew of the talent and the remorse and the insight that was just locked away. Uh, so I began helping her. And then um, a couple of years later, I ended up getting parole. And uh, we ended up, uh, I forget how we got in contact after I got 
um, after I paroled and I became a, huh? I'm not, I don't, I do not remember it all. It was be, a little bit before I was working for LSBC. Um, it was a lot before that, but um, yeah, but then, you know, came out, I became a subject in the film. And I also, a lot of the footage that you see, some of the scenes that you see inside is actual footage that I shot inside. And then there's a piece that I shot um, on the campus of Chabot when I was working as the program coordinator for uh, one of the programs we started at Chabot that helps former incarcerated people um, navigate higher education, right? Um, and and the film is on Tubi. Um, there's a link that uh, we'll, we'll try to get sent out that you guys can go and watch the film, you know, for free on Tubi and um, check it out. I would love to hear what you all think about it. Um, if, if we go back up a little bit to the, these areas of expertise, um, I think it's like the third, um, yeah. Um, I, I consider myself, I didn't really know how to put this, but I consider myself a visionary and a strategist. And basically what that means is I love pushing the envelope. I love creating, like, I, I think I've become very adept at creating that and and an atmosphere that requires people to push themselves beyond what they normally would, right? And by that, I'm not just talking about people who are incarcerated. I'm talking about organizations. I'm talking about people that's doing the work. I'm talking about people who are have been racist, right? I'm talking about people who are in gangs. I'm talking to every walk of life. My job has been to push the envelope. And then once you push the envelope, and it becomes, then there's a point where it becomes cool. And then people start to step in and they start to take over. And then next thing you know, they created the idea. <laughs> and I just sit back and I, I love it though. I love it because it's pushing the envelope. You know, um, I'm a restorative justice practitioner. Um, I was doing restorative justice um, before you can go get a degree for restorative justice. In fact, there are many people <laughs> around this country who are um, offering degrees in restorative justice that actually tr were trained by us. Um, uh, as you heard earlier, I've been a journalist since I've been home and I, I love holding on to that title of filmmaker and it encompasses so much more than just holding a, holding a camera because as a filmmaker, um, you're there are times when you're in front of and behind the scenes or directing the scene, um, you really have to um, have a passion for what you do. Um, and I love what I do. And I, I would encourage that. I think that's a good point to tell everybody that follow what you love. Like, and I was saying, I was saying this earlier. Um, when we were creating all this, like, I didn't know if I would ever come home. I didn't know what would be the outcome of it. In fact, there were times which in which I could have been locked up for it. There were times when, 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 you know, because of prison has its politics as well, unfortunately, but there were times when guys dropped kites on me because, you know, kites are these anonymous notes that claim that you either did something or that somebody's going to do something to you if they don't get you off the yard or they claim that you did something. Somebody dropped an anonymous note on me and claimed that I had, that I was doing something that was just, utterly false, but thanks to my reputation that um, when the when the prison guards walked up to me, um, they told me what was going on and they said that, they accused me of sleeping or sneaking around with a staff or with a volunteer person. And they walked up to me and they said that, um, but for your reputation, you would be in the hole right now because normally that's what happens. But because of who, Everybody knew who I had, be I had become. They knew that it was false. They did say to me, though, if they'd have told us you was running a business, you'd be in jail. <laughs> but they knew I wasn't sneaking around doing nothing crazy. I, I could have been running a business, but I wasn't. <laughs> right? But um, but that um, the point here that I'm I'm trying to 
emphasize is about your 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 narrative when you become who you're meant to be and you walk in that and people really get to know you nobody can tell people anything different about you when they get to know you so here it was people had they they wanted to get me out the way um so that they could take over the studio right and this is crazy how things happen but but because of my reputation that that didn't happen that that didn't happen i wasn't letting people do um I wouldn't let people come into the studio and wreck the program either. Even as like a lot of times because we're incarcerated, there's this thing like the guy comes in and he just takes over everything and destroys stuff and you're just like helpless and, and not able to do anything. It's like, well, no, I'm I'm not that guy. I'm not gonna, you can't bring a phone in here and download stuff and jeopardize the entire program. That's not gonna happen. You have to leave. You can't make us leave. I bet you leave. You're not going to jeopardize this program. And one time they went and got the police. And they came back with the police and told me that um, they say you're not, that you're telling people they can't come into the studio. And my words to the, the police asked me, so what's going on? And my words to the police was, you and I know I can't tell you what's going on. But if you want me to run the program, you got to let me run the program. If you don't, when something happens, don't come say shit to me. I told him just like that. He looked at me and looked at the guy and walked off. Right? And that's what it was. Um, say that again. Well, I, I can show the, um, let me show the um, Invisible Return. I'm going to show that one, the last one. Um, this is a project that I'm working on. I'm actually, my goal is to turn this into uh, a series. Um, and um, this is this is what I'm working on. And I, I guess my, my pitch for this has been that, um, I guess it's a cross between uh, 60 minutes in law and order, but it's the reverse of law and order. What do I mean by that? Law and order, when law and order comes on, what do you see? Law, dun, dun, dun. And it starts with a crime scene and the guy's like leaned over and he's like, right. who did this? And they spend the entire time trying to figure out who committed the crime. Well, what we want to do is open up in the middle of a crime scene and we're going to spend the entire show unraveling why. Um, oh no, this is not the one. The next one. Down, My husband. The next one. I'll send these out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this one. It's a small Fuck it. In 1994, I participated in the takeover robbery of a computer parts store. Um, myself and three other individuals armed with weapons ran into this computer parts place, um, held everybody at gunpoint, beat the security guard up, um, duct taped some people. Uh, 
Get in. Get the fuck in. And went through the warehouse looking for computer parts. Several police cars began to surround the building. And we fled. And my co-defendants who ran in the opposite um, direction, they ran into a business next door, snatched the guy at gunpoint, then carjacked him for his truck. So as a result of my participation in the robbery, I was also found guilty of aggravated kidnapping and sentenced to life um, with the possibility of parole. Okay, I had a question. Uh, I'm in the because pops didn't uh, your life skills for the stroke. And broke without skills, how can you formulate a plan? And some without plans, how can you grow to be a man? So look what you got is a lost kid in the streets. We listen to his instincts, strap himself with heat, patrols his turf like a cop who walks a beat. So when enemies come, he won't beat the one that leaks. The hook fellas peep and decide. That he... When you're young, we get into a lot of things that we don't realize we're getting ourselves into. Well, I grew up gangbanging. I was 13 years old when I had a 30 year old man put a pistol in my hand and I grew up living that way. I grew up believing that that's the way you had to do things in order for your survival. And I couldn't see outside of that box. So I'm thinking I'm just going in for a robbery but we're gonna get cashed out at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, what I got was a life sentence. Every lifer has to go to the Board of Prison Hearings in order to um, be found suitable and come home. When you walk into that boardroom, they want to know that you're taking full responsibility for your crime, that you have remorse for what you did, that you have some insight into what were the causes the factors that led you to commit your crime. And you have to be able to communicate that in a way that they get it. And if you don't, you're not coming home. Because if anybody I would want to see insight or remorse from is a person who's already committed a murder and now is back in prison on a life sentence. I want to know your insight from the top to the bottom, from the bottom to the top before I would let you out to commit another crime, a third serious crime against society. My daughter would always write me and she would ask me, Daddy, when you coming home? In the first two years of my incarceration, she had about 20 something different addresses. Every time she would get to a new address, she would make sure that she wrote me that I knew where she was at. She wrote a letter to me saying, um, God, um, please let my daddy out of prison. I almost started to accept the fact that she probably would. I don't have an answer. Here's this little girl and she's missing her daddy. At that point, I think I was starting to feel lost. And I cracked like, here my daughter is crying out to me. I would have gave my life for her, but I didn't live for her. Time is 10 minutes to 4 in the p.m. It should be noted for the record that all parties that were here 
expired to our recess for deliberations is now back in the room. Mr. Williams. The panel reviewed all information received from the public and all relevant information that was here before us today in concluding that the prisoner is not suitable for parole because he still poses a present risk of danger to society or a threat to public safety if released from prison. This thing is slain, then it's straight to the rich, but what it seeks to change up and meet the pain that just increased. Here's the crossroads, tears for the lost souls. It was us who created the path for lost shows. Cultural genocide, many of men have died over guns, drugs, money, and women. What will we rise? The future of our youth is bleak, how it stands now. The GOE's blocked till the scrappers to stand down. The violence we can fight and unite it, and we will leave mother's grief. I believe there's nothing we can achieve. That's pretty much it. It's just a sizzle reel. This is what I'm pitching now to get funded for the producer here. And each series is going to that that actually is a theme song right there too, the theme music. Um that's the theme music. I use it. You can let it play low if you want to. Yeah. So um the goal is, yeah. There's that. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> what do y'all think? Oh, he come to us. So we have reached our Q and A section. So I'm gonna go ahead, Caitlin has the microphone. I'm gonna go ahead and grab it from her. But if anyone has any questions, we're gonna go ahead and walk around or comments for Troy. Um, and then at the end, I'm gonna go ahead and give you guys a little bit of information on how to find his website. Well, I'll break the ice since nobody put their hands up. Are you doing a piece on Irving Ramirez? Not yet. Not yet, okay. No. <laughs> Not yet, but I will. Um, at some point, once I, you know, secure the funding to get this series done, I am going to be looking for a, a series of stories, and they they're going to involve people who have dramatic stories. But I'm also real big on um, a person understanding their own, like being able to articulate their own growth and insight, because they have to be the voice of transformation. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Troy? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, I enjoyed your talk. It was very enlightening. So I appreciate you being here. Uh, my question is, how many times did you have to go in front of the parole board and how many times did you get denied before you are here today? So I went five times. I was paroled on my fifth time. Um, the first time I walked into the boardroom, um, you're shackled. Your hands are shackled and your feet are shackled. And you're basically walking in the boardroom like this because you can't, you know, the, the, the way the cuffs sit on your ankles, you can't even walk right. And you're supposed to sit down, take notes, and articulate why you should be free while you're shackled like an animal. Um, I think the, the third time I went in was the time that um, there's another piece in there that um, I'll send out to y'all, but the I think that was the worst time for me because that was the time I had to go back and tell my daughter that um, I wasn't coming home. Um, and, you know, I'm a tough guy. I can take it. But when you start to see your effects on the people you love, that's when it really hits you. Um, and I didn't tell I didn't tell him I was going the next the next two times. Cause I, I just, I couldn't bear to tell him. Uh, and on my fifth time I got paroled. And uh, you can see, I think I mentioned this in my in my TED talk, but um, I, I was driving off to prison and I called her and uh, she almost hung up the phone cause she thought I was joking. Cause she's only used to accepting collect calls, you know? And she's like, quit playing. Whoever this is, she was starting to go off and I started to laugh and she was like, wait, what? She, she knew my laugh, you know, <laughs> and uh, the rest is history. 
Thank you so much for sharing that, Troy. It looks like we have another question over here. I have just a little bit of exposure to restorative justice. You may know um, Kazu Haga and some others yeah. that go into prison. I live in community with Kazu. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I've done a little work with him too. I'm wondering, um, what does your process look like, say, compared to that? Um, model, which is the only one I'm really familiar with, and our joy has also um, right. exposed me a little bit. Right. So yeah, I, I do a lot of work with our joy as well too, um, and I, I'm in community with Kazu, who's primarily has been teaching Kingian nonviolence. Um, and shout out to Chemical Form, my Chemical Form people. Um, but having a restorative model in a in a controlled prison environment. Um, versus an academic setting, um, you know, versus a room full of adults who just might get mad and storm out the room is very different than hanging on the block trying to have it with guys who still got pistols in their pocket. Uh, I think the, 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 the methodology is very similar in that it's all about allowing the person to feel heard and and helping the person understand um, what um, to express their needs and how to meet um, their unmet needs. I think is the is the root of it, right? Um, so the basis, you know, as restorative justice was um, brought to me, um, the basis of it, or and I should say, restorative practices, because restorative justice involves more of a justice system approach, but restorative practices as um, as I originally uh, learned them, was um, we all sit in circle. You know, there are no big eyes and little U's in the circle, and everybody has an opportunity to express what it is that they feel, and um, and attempt to do so in a in a way that you know can articulate what their needs are. And we emphasize all of the stakeholders being at the table, and so sometimes. Um, it just involves me sitting there hearing a person. Sometimes, sometimes I'm not even able to say much other than try to throw a little piece of jewel in there later. But the biggest part of it is being able to build a relationship with people. Because once you build a relationship with people and people know that you care, then you can almost tell them anything. Once once they know that you care about them, you can you can tell them anything. So there, you know, early on, I might not say much or depending on the heat of the moment that they might be in, I might, I might, I might not say much. Or I might wait for that moment that I'd be like, and sometimes I do it in a joking way, I'd be like, that's the craziest shit. <laughs> you know, I do it in different kind of ways, right? Um, but it's 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 really trying to get to their process and not force them to process their stuff in my time frame. I hope that makes sense. Some of it's it's kind of like sometimes it's hard to explain because there's a lot of in the moment um things that that happen, but uh, there's a big difference when you allow a person um to feel heard and you can articulate back to them what um what you heard them say and they feel that that you're listening to them that resonates different with them and then um also being a, to try to help them create a pathway out of their environment. You know, I, I'll just say this and then we can go to the next question. Um, I remember we, when we were inside, there was this young girl that came into one of our groups and she was on the verge of prostituting herself. And we all was giving her a whole bunch of stuff, right? We was just throwing jewels at her. And she stood up in front of us before they left and she said, I hear you. I hear everything you're saying. She said, let me just say, I even believe what you're saying to me. But she said, I got to go home at night. What you going to do about that? And there was nothing we can do but give her a bunch of good words, right? And so that's why a lot of my mission has been to try to do things to change the conditions of the environment that people live in. I think that that's a big, that's a big factor. So I, don't know, I hope that answers it. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I know one of the things we talk about in our CCJS classes is definitely environment and reforming the environments. Um, does anyone else have questions or comments for Troy? All right, I'll go here and then I'll come over there. 
Um, so earlier you made this comment that I really loved where you were saying how you can't solve a problem if parts of the equation are missing. Basically, like you can't solve a problem without including the people being personally impacted by the problem. And I was wondering what you would recommend to help make sure that um, people are being included in these kinds of events and that their voices are being heard. Like events here? Uh, like, yes, like, but like in general, like the kind of events where you go speak at where what can we all do to help encourage um, those from the communities directly being impacted to attend and to feel like we actually care about them and that we want to help and that we're not just here to just speculate. Right, exactly. Um, you know, that's a really good question. And I think the first thing that comes in my mind, because even, you know, your instructor is connected to a lot of different organizations that are like rooted um, in it. And I, that may be the safest pathway um, to make stuff happen, right? Because you know, the truth is everybody can't walk the streets where I come from, not without some kind of passport first, You know, if, if you understand what I'm trying to say, you know, so I wouldn't recommend you just walk up in my hood and be like, hey, big homies, <laughs> how you doing? I'm here, you know, <laughs> I think, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, recommend it. And I would also say that the work this is important and, and this might this might sting a little bit for some people, but I like stingers sometimes. Um, and I mean this in a humble way. A lot of times we focus on half the equation still. And what do I mean by that? Oftentimes we focus on the group that has been impacted by racism or by oppression or by other things, but we seldom do we turn our attention to the folks who are doing the impacting, right? And sometimes those folks are sitting right at the dinner table with us, right? And so how do we have those hard conversations in a restorative fashion, I think are equally as important. Don't get me wrong, we need resources um, for our community. Our community in many ways are definitely impacted. And there's a lot of great stuff that's going on um, in our communities as well. And um, we need to also have those conversations um, with with people on the other side of that aisle who are doing the impacting, um, who may not understand the harm that they're causing or the harm that has been caused to them. I always say, in order for me to hurt somebody, uh, I had to be hurt. So in order for people to be acting out in racism and have this, you know, supremacist kind of mindset about themselves, that's the same kind of pain just on the other side the other side of the same coin and so i think we have to work with 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 them as well i think we need groups for them as well i think we need some understanding from them as well and at some point um we all need to come together and have a and have a restorative dialogue um when it's when it's safe and you know to do so thank you so much for did that sharing. answer your question thank you she said yes <laughs> um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I know that one thing that I've experienced when speaking about this is there is a lot of um, unawareness in our communities about the different issues happening. And so there's a lot of um, misinformation being produced. And then also with the unawareness, we see that perpetuating a lot of these issues and the microaggressions and the exactly. racism. Exactly. And I want to say this real quick before you get before you this question. I was sitting in a group one day and I just, I had my head down in the front of the group. I was thinking I was something, something was heavy on my mind, but I was listening, but I was just like, I wasn't visually paying attention, but I was like aware of my environment and hearing. And I heard this guy tell this story and I just knew this dude was a black dude from Compton, Hawaii, right? And I looked up and he was the whitest, blonde haired blue eyed dude that, that, that was in the entire prison was telling this story that sounds so familiar that 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 I recognize it as my own story, right? So a lot of times we're not too far apart than we think we are. We just call stuff differently. 
Yes. Thank you for that. Um, and you had a question, right? Hi, thank you for coming and telling us all about this. Um, you won't find me arguing at all that the justice system needs a lot of work to be way more effective. It's disappointing to see where it is now, to say the least. Yep. But I am curious if you ever feel like in instances of restorative justice, disservices are done to victims in certain cases. Right. So... Um, oftentimes, the people who have committed crimes aren't seen as victims either. Uh, and I say that the answer to your question is, right, absolutely. And this is why when I say all of the stakeholders have to be at the table, I mean all of the stakeholders have to be at the table. And I'm somebody who walks with a lot of remorse for some of the things that I've done. And I never like to go places without acknowledging my own harm um, that I've caused. And I will say that it was sitting with someone who was a victim of a robbery. When people used to ask me, they used to say, um, what do you think your victim went through? And I didn't really know how to answer that question. Maybe they were afraid, you know, I didn't really, I didn't know how to answer that question. And when I heard this lady come tell her story, I realized that because of what happened to her, she had become so um, afraid that she cowered in and became afraid of everything out here. And I realized that what had happened to me is that I became so afraid that I cowered outward and I buffaloed at everything outside of me, right? That became my protective device, right? And so my brother was murdered not 40 days into my prison sentence for the, since, since 1994, I've watched my mother get physically sick every year to the point that she doesn't even remember why. Right. So I'm I'm with you 100% in that. And and all of the stakeholders have to be at the table. And what I'm, my goal for saying this the way that I'm saying it is that how do we bring the community together in a way that allows us to see the hurt of each other. Right? Like, like I think that's our ultimate goal is to be able to try to do that. That's that's my goal. And and I don't I don't I don't have answers. I got more questions. You know, I got more questions than I got answers, right? They say the older you get, the more you know you don't know. Right. And um and so but that's 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 my hope is that we can begin to have these because I'm like this too. I'm I'm at heart, I'm an abolitionist. Right? At heart, I'm an abolitionist. I would love to see a point where we don't need prisons anymore. Can I say that everybody inside a prison should be let out tomorrow? No, some people are gonna get hurt if they get let out tomorrow. They're gonna be hurting somebody tomorrow. Can I say that I know thousands of people who are ready to come home that's gonna come home and do some really good work? Out here in the community, absolutely. But what's our measuring stick? How do we how do we get to that point? And I think that's what we have to collectively sit with each other enough um, so that we can actually have that conversation with all of us in the room, being able to have an intelligent conversation or some kind of way filtering that back out um, to the community because we need it. We we have to we we have to. I want protection. And want my family as protected. And I, and I don't care who live next door to me. Can you can you stay next door to me? Can we live in peace? If you can't, I don't give a damn who you are. I don't want you next door to me. If you can't, if I gotta worry about you around my family, 
I don't want you next door. I don't care what color, race, creed, gender. I don't care who you are. It don't matter. If you can live next door and we can live in peace, let's live in peace. That's, but we have to, I think we have to collectively figure out the way to do it and not um, fall into these um, political like um, lines that, that, that in my view, div divide us the same the way Crip and Blood divided me. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing that, Troy. Thank you. So you mentioned community organizations and good ways to plug in. Our folks here always need internships, trying to get their hours. I need some interns. Oh, you need interns. I, need some I was going to see if you knew any organizations. <laughs> I do. Restorative media. So you'll see three projects right here in front of you. Um, one is my podcast that I'll be starting up um, very soon. Um, we have a formerly incarcerated speaker series um, where we go, and all of this is underneath the umbrella of restorative media. But we have a, also have a formerly incarcerated speaker series that we take formerly incarcerated people out to the island of Alcatraz to interface um, with them. And we're also um, building up some other projects where we're getting more involved in um, some of the resentencing projects and figuring out how to create pieces that will um, support people's freedom. Um, how to how to you know um, highlight the narrative of transformation for people in a way that when somebody look at this person they're not just seeing this pile of evidence that says they're a bad person but they can see something visually and artistically that establishes how they got to that point um, and what they've done to turn it around as well I think that's even as as more important as the show I had to I, for myself. I had to understand how did I go from being an innocent kid who at one point I wouldn't even step on an ant to being a gun toting gang banging felon willing to put a gun at somebody's head and rob him. What happened in that kid's life that turned him into that? And how do we fix it so that the next kid don't go through that? That's the mission I'm on. So restorativemedia.org. Um, I have the contact page right there. You can um, sign into the contact page and send me some information, or maybe we can get together and figure out something. Um, but I would, I would love some, um, some support. Well, thank you so much. Any other questions or comments for Troy? One more over here. Got me up here crying and stuff. What's wrong with you? <laughs> supposed to be tough. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> yes. um, I just wanted to say thank you. And I think it takes a lot to acknowledge mistakes. So thank you for that as well. I think one of the things we talk a lot in my criminal justice class um, is even after you're released from prison, it kind of feels like you're still in prison because you get all this like backlash and it just feels like it's an ongoing system um, even when you're released. Um, so I don't know your own perspective on that. Um, so no, absolutely. Um, so when I came home, uh, <laughs> I was forced to take a, a listen to this because people knew better for me than I knew for myself. They forced me to take an eight week resume writing class. Now, mind you, I had been teaching people how to write resumes, paper resumes for 10 years. Right. But uh, I already had a job lined up. I had everything lined up. But in fact, um, I was actually writing for the Oakland Post <laughs> and they told me that in order for me to stay in this trans just transitional place, that I needed to take an eight week long resume. Who needs an eight week long resume writing course? Like I'm not trying to teach it. I've taught it before, right? Like, But even if you are, who needs eight weeks to go through a resume writing, right? And so it's those kind of things. And then I was also told that um, there's a lot of, I didn't really, I guess from where I was coming from too, um, having been gone so long, I, nothing could really like, nothing really like truly like upset me at first when I first came home. Cause you know, I lived in a, this is the wall. That's my other wall. That's where I lived at for two centuries, for, for two decades. Right. So Nothing really could upset me when people would talk crazy to me. I'd be like, oh, you're having a bad day. 
I'm sorry, you need a hug. <laughs> you know, I was just, I was just happy to be home, right? So I didn't really fault the people um, in the organization. You know, I felt my my people skills were pretty good. I didn't really fault them, but I knew that it was coming from somewhere, from somebody in the office who hadn't even bothered to meet us or even understood who they were dealing with, right? Who were making these decisions up. And that's why I started to work and get with a lot of organizations changing policies and, and working on stuff like that. And, and, and why I showed up in a lot of spaces to contribute um, my voice. Um, and I think a lot of us coming home now are just doing that. You know, the term lived experience is, is coming, it's coming like language now. It's coming, it's coming terms now, right? Um, another thing too that I'll just say this quickly is that we also are conscious about the way that we use language. Um, you will never hear me um, refer to somebody as inmate unless I'm like, you know, acting out something in the movie or trying to emphasize a point because I personally view it as a very derogatory term, you know, I always refer to our incarcerated people or, um, you know, a prisoner that I look at them like a prisoner of war sometimes, you know, uh, in that fashion. Uh, so I think I'm getting a little off your question, but absolutely there are so many um, things that happen out here that, and then, so I'll say this too, is that there was a part of me that was brilliant, right? I came, the, my first six months home, I learned how to root my phone. So I, I like, I learned how to, and people know what that is, right? <laughs> I learned how to root my phone. So I was making my phone do all kind of like crazy stuff, right? And then on the other hand, I was a baby back to the street. And there were parts that I needed my handheld, right? But I didn't want to feel like a baby. Um, and it's trying to balance that out with somebody I think is is an important. And, and people are individuals, so different individuals may have um, different needs. They may be brilliant in this area, and some people need more handholding. And, and regardless of who that person is, they need to be checked on. They need that phone call. They need to feel like somebody like care about them. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering that question, Troy, and sharing everything you've shared this evening. If we have no other questions or comments, um, I will go ahead and come back up. Oh. I have a few things that I wanted to point out before we wrap up this evening. Thank you so much. First, um, the surveys that are on your guys' chairs.